Up until this point, all of my laser content has been around the diode laser technology. That's all about to change. Today I have the Zuit Cloud Pro 2 50 watt CO2 laser. Hey everybody, my name is Sam and welcome back to Sam Craft. In today's video, I'm gonna be looking at the Jewett Cloud Pro 2 50 watt CO2 laser, go through the benefits, features, but most importantly, the things that are not so good about it. I want to start off this video by letting you know this is the very first CO2 machine I've ever used. This is the, my learning curve and I've had my training wheels on for a while and this is about three months after getting the machine that I'm actually going to make the video for you guys. CO2 lasers are quite different from diode, not so much as far as basic functionality and stuff, but there's different speed, power settings and other type things as far as focusing that have a little bit of a learning curve whenever you switch from one to the other. In this video I'm going to be covering the packaging, assembly and build quality of the machine. I'll go over the learning curves and things that I had to learn as compared to diode and CO2 lasers, talk about material tests, how I've been using the machine in real life, and of course cover the issues and complaints. So let's talk about packaging, assembly, and overall build quality. When I got the machine, it is shipped to me in a wooden crate and packaged very, very well. There was no damage to the box itself, no damage to the laser or any of the components inside, and nothing had moved around or shifted during shipment. This laser is heavy. It is 94 pounds, so you may need help lifting this up. As far as assembly, there's really not much to speak of. You unpack everything, set your laser on your workbench, and then connect up the flexible duct hose from your machine to the inline duct fan, and then from there, outside. That's pretty much it. As far as build quality, I don't have any complaints there either. The machine is quite heavy at 94 pounds. It has a nice glass top that will show off every speck of dust in your workshop, but otherwise is a nice clean surface, gives it a nice sleek look. The housing feels like it's steel, but most of the internal components and framing is all out of aluminum. This machine does use linear rails for all three axes for movement, makes everything super tight, nice and smooth movements, and everything just seems well made. But going along with build quality is the fact that when this machine is cutting wood and the fans are running, there is no smoke escaping into the room. This machine does very well on exhausting all of the smoke and fumes out and does great as far as sealing up the case and keeping things where they need to be. Now that being said, even though it does not have any smoke smells while it's running, as soon as you open that lid, you're gonna have some residual smells come out of the cabinet. It's not gonna be smoke per se, but it will be the smell and odor. So I don't recommend using this inside your home or anywhere where you might be sensitive to smells or not wanna smell that stuff all the time. As I mentioned, this is my first CO2 laser. Up until this point, I've been using diode lasers or the Galvo diode lasers. So there were a few learning curves with this machine with me. First and foremost is the way you focus the machine. You have to put your focus in light burn and tell it to move the Z height down. You can't just flip down a kickstand, move that head manually and go from there. What this means is you've got to have a set of dial calipers or no exact material thicknesses you're working with before you ever start using the machine. Another learning curve I had was remembering that this machine may cut 20 inches by 11.8, but it will not engrave 20 inches by 11.8. The reason for that is it has to have its ramp up and ramp down time beyond the engraving to slow down the head and reverse direction. Therefore, the engraving size is a little bit smaller than the actual cut size. That's something that I ran into a handful of times as I was designing, wanted to engrave something, I would click, nothing would happen, no error message would pop up, and the only indication that something was wrong is a little red light would show around the white button ring on the top of the machine. After playing around and remembering, wait a second, it won't engrave as large as it will cut, all I had to do was move my design towards the center a little bit more, and then I was good to go. So basically, those are my two learning curves. Z height focusing and engraving is smaller than cutting. 
not too bad I guess as far as material tests and real life uses you guys are going to find out that I'm pretty boring on this front I have really only been using this machine to cut Baltic birch plywood I have been prototyping and making products that I will soon launch on my website and so I've been using it to batch out wood production items cut things and that's about it I have tried engraving slate with it and that was fine it worked as expected but then I don't really use this machine for engraving because I have my X tool set up and I use that for engraving so yes I guess I'm pretty boring on that front that I don't really test it beyond its capabilities and I really just use this as a cutting machine at least for right now now as far as things beyond the wood and slate I do have concerns about Putting anything such as drinkware in this machine or anything tall because of its maximum Z height work of only two inches. It definitely seems like this machine is set up for flat work, things such as wood or very thin objects, and nothing as far as drinkware or things like that. Now, the machine does come with two rotaries. I have not tested those because, like I said, it's not something I do, but it does come with them, so perhaps that might be something you can check into. Just remember that this machine's working height being two inches from the bottom of the bed. Once you add your rotary into that and your object, you may actually have to lift this machine up, which is not going to be an easy task because it's 94 pounds. Just an example of how the machine can technically do something, but you may not find it really realistic in your workshop. Let's go ahead and get to the meat and potatoes of this video and talk about my issues and complaints. First and foremost, the online cloud software. Don't waste your time. Don't do it. it um, it's limited. It's not very handy, it's not user friendly. The software wouldn't even connect to my machine even after going through Wi-Fi setup, account creations, and overall, it was kind of just a waste of my time. That's okay though, this machine is light burn compatible. Just take a USB cable, plug it into your machine, your PC, and you're good to go. The other issue I have is with the onboard camera. It is pretty much unusable for me. It will connect to my machine, it will open up in Lightburn fine, but it will only be good until you start your job. Once you start your job, the camera loses connection and it won't re-establish without you physically unplugging the cable, plugging it back in, and reselecting it in Lightburn. This is so much of a hassle that I've honestly just quit using it. I don't use it as far as any of my workflows and it's something that I just relegate to actually not having with my machine. I've worked with support on several different options. They first wanted me to check drivers and everything, which of course we did. Check the cables, swap cables, all of that stuff. Then they said that the fix was to downgrade Lightburn by a, a complete full version down to an old version. I didn't want to do that because as soon as I did that, I lose compatibility with all my files. But after going back and forth a little bit, I said, fine, I'll give it a shot. Downgraded light burn, but it still didn't fix the camera issue for me. What my particular issue is, is when the camera is plugged in, I will hear the Windows PC connect sound, you know, the little, I don't know, jingle it plays whenever you plug something in. Connects, finds it, no problem. But as I'm running, it'll all of a sudden disconnect, reconnect, and it'll tell me there's a problem with the device. It's repeatable. It happens all the time. My machine is up to date. All drivers have been updated. All Windows updates have been applied. And throughout my workshop of about six different machines, this is the only one that gives me trouble. It's also the only one with a camera, so I can't really say much other than the camera is a little bit weird. Now looking online at the Jewett Cloud Pro user group on Facebook, there are many, many other people who say they have problems with their camera as well to make me think that it is not a computer issue, it's not a user error, and it's just something going on weird with the camera, the software, light burn, I don't know. People aren't talking good, but otherwise it just doesn't seem to work well. Another problem that I've run into is that this machine will occasionally just crash Lightburn and I can't tell you why or when, it just will make Lightburn stop responding. At that point what I do is turn off the machine, I wait for Lightburn to tell me an error has occurred and just force quit and relaunch it. It is very frustrating to have that happen. It happens probably, I don't know, maybe like once every three or four jobs and that's pretty frustrating. But what it will do very quickly is teach you to save your work at every single step set up auto save and light burn if that's an option and just remember to save your file because at any second the program could quit working for you. The crashing is something that is specific to this machine. I don't have any problems with crashing with my X tool, my Jimitsu, my Atom Stack lasers, my Retour laser, nothing else crashes light burn but the Jewett cloud. So it's unique. The other complaint with the machine is that the air assist or the air pump that's inside this cabinet, while being convenient and pretty from a design aesthetic, is actually a pretty bad design. The reason for that is as you are cutting a job out and you're filling the cabinet with smoke and all the soot and kind of smells and stuff, yes, most of it is being exhausted out that back fan, but I have watched it. Some of it will get pulled over, 
sucked into the air assist fan, which then means it's getting directed straight back down to the lens. This is verified by taking the lens apart and cleaning it and seeing that it is full of soot up inside it, around the lens, and all in places it really should not be. While I understand the design aesthetics of let's put it all in a cabinet and make it look sleek and slim and modern, they've really just set you up to have to do a lot more maintenance and cleaning on the machine than you really should have to. I've gotten to the point where I clean my machine every single time before I begin to use it and after every two or three cut jobs. I take apart the lens, take apart the air hose, wipe everything off and put it all back together. Now each time I do that, I'm also removing quite a bit of residue and soot. So it's telling me that my efforts are needed and that that air assist is really hurting things. So at this point, you may be wondering, okay, cool, great video, Sam, good pros, cons. Should I get it, should I not? What do you think? Honestly, I can't tell you anything. I don't have another CO2 laser to compare this to. This is the very first CO2 laser I've ever used. So I have nothing to go by to know if this is awesome or terrible. You just have to take what you've seen here, add it to your notes, add it to your mental lists of pros and cons, and continue to consume and research information. That's all I can tell you at this point. Now, as time goes on, if I get other machines in here to test out, I'll be able to compare them, give a contrast, and go from there. But otherwise, I guess I'm not much help. I will say this, my number one recommendation for anyone, including myself, if I'm looking to spend my money on a machine, the first thing I do is look at the customer support from the company, but then, more importantly, the user support that is out there. Look up Facebook groups, web forums, wherever. Find other people who use the exact same machine, listen to what their complaints are, listen to what problems they have, listen to what they think of their investments, and then make a decision. That's usually what I do, so that's my advice to you. Otherwise, hopefully this video was helpful, educational perhaps, informative, and you enjoyed it either way. As always, I appreciate you guys watching. Take care, and I'll see you guys next time in the workshop.